Welcome to Trending in Education. Mike Palmer here. Always happy to have a return engagement. Today we have Ryan Craig returning to the show. Ryan writes a bi-weekly newsletter called Gap Letter at gapletter.com. I was just ramping up on it. It'll be part of what we talk about in our conversation today. First off, Ryan, welcome to Trending in Education. Welcome back. It's great. Good to see you again. Glad to be back. It's, uh, I guess, a high compliment that, you know, your listeners didn't uh, bar me from <laughs> returning. Yeah, no revolts, uh, as far as I can tell. No no boycotts were inspired, so so all is good. I do I, I do have a tendency to offend people. Yeah. Uh, no. Yeah, a little bit, a little bit of edge, you know, a little bit of, you want a little mustard on your hot dog, I always like to say. But, uh, but Brian, just reading off some of your claims to fame that folks hadn't heard, Brian wrote a book called College Disrupted in 2015, and then A New You, Faster and Cheaper Alternatives to College in 2018, and then writes regularly for Forbes, TechCrunch, Inside Higher Ed. I really have been enjoying the newsletter, but it's been a little while. You know, we all are aging in dog years these days, Ryan. So what have you been up to lately? What's going on in your world? Yeah, no, look, when I wrote the book, what, three years ago, it was sort of a guided tour through the emerging landscape of what we call last mile training, which is effectively what is needed to fill the gap between the education and employment ecosystems, the combination of digital and tech skills, platform skills, plus business skills, knowledge that our existing higher education institutions don't train on and that companies and employers are increasingly requiring Mm-hmm. in entry level positions, you know, sort of the landscape of boot camps and apprenticeship programs. And we sort of hit upon a formula that really worked better than anything we'd seen. So I forget the last time we spoke, but it, it may, I think it was probably when my firm was called University Ventures. We changed our name to Achieve Partners in part because the pathways that we're, we're building aren't necessarily university focused mm-hmm. and it's not ventures because they, the the model that we we hit upon was in recognition of the fact that the hardest part of this gap to bridge is the end connection to the employer and developing those connections as an educational institution or training provider is really hard, if not impossible. I mean, developing them in a deep, meaningful way, not just, will you come recruit my students? So we had a lot of success starting with what I'll call intermediaries uh, that are already in the market that are already serving dozens or hundreds of employers as clients, Mm -hmm. business services companies, solutions companies, staffing companies that are operating in skill gap sectors like software development, data science and analytics, cybersecurity, Salesforce, Mm -hmm. you name it. And so that's what we've been doing. We raised a a fund we call our, our workforce fund where we're acquiring business services companies and skill gap sectors of, of tech and now healthcare. We, we bought a, a healthcare staffing company, staffing nurses and occupational therapists and speech language therapists into schools, school Mm -hmm. districts, Mm -hmm. all in skill gap areas. And we add last mile training to these businesses and transform them into what we call talent as a service Mm -hmm. companies, where in addition to delivering the services, solutions, experienced talent, they were delivering previously, they're now delivering a new product, which is purpose trained entry level talent that we can make available at scale on a try before you buy basis Mm -hmm. to employers. And that really solves the problem that candidates have, which is they're interested in getting a job in cybersecurity or Salesforce or data science and analytics, but they don't have the specific skills. And more important, they don't have the work experience. And then also solving the problem of employers who, I mean, there are lots of people who have, you know, maybe a trailhead certification for Salesforce, but they've never actually worked as a Salesforce administrator. Right. And so where are you going to get that experience? Who's going to, who's going to hire you? Well, our company, Cloud for Good, will hire you because they'll hire you into what they call the Talent for Good training program. And uh, you'll go through, you'll get the skills and you'll get the experience because it'll be assigned on a client project. Right. That's a two-year pathway where the expectation is after two years, you're going to convert over uh, to an employee at the client. Yeah. And so clients love it because they're not only getting the work done, but they're getting the talent at the end of the line, the talent that they couldn't find and talent that tends to persist a lot longer than direct hires. Yeah. Um, So it's working extremely well. We've made five investments in the last year and a half, and uh, we'll probably do another three or four this year. Again, you know, looking at all of these different areas where, I mean, you can 
look at the BLS data and we'll tell you where we have all these open unfilled jobs in the economy. And that's where we need, we desperately need to build intermediaries to help bridge the, bridge the gap. Yeah. And it's interesting, the evolution from university ventures to achieve partners in that it, it sounds like you're thinking and, and maybe some of your investment theses evolved over time in terms of how much change was actually going to be affected within the university setting, within the traditional higher ed ecosystem versus outside. We do want to get a little bit into the gap litter stuff because that's sure. just spicy and entertaining. We haven't given up on universities. So we have an ed tech strategy as well, which is focused on investing in tech companies and platforms that are trying to sort of create a revolution from within. So I think of our workforce strategy as revolution from without and our ed tech strategy is revolution from within because there's a lot that we can do with technology to improve student outcomes. Well, maybe we could talk about both of those things in the rest of our conversation together. To make it more spicy, we want the spicy mustard on our hot dog, as we described before. The latest edition of the Gap Letter is talking about Don't Look Up, the recent Netflix film that did garner, it's, it's an Oscar-nominated film to make it relevant, which is great. We like to connect to what's relevant out in the world. You were connecting some interesting things to the way Don't Look Up thinks about I guess climate change, you know, manifested in the metaphor of a big meteor that's coming our way or comets coming our way. You were making some interesting analogies around STEM, science, technology. Could you expand a little bit on what you wrote about? Yeah, no, absolutely. The quote that I start off with is, but it's all math. And that's a line from the, from the film. And, you know, the point is that science and, and, and tech have never been more important to us and we're falling down as a country in lots of different ways. I mean, just look at the way in which we have red states and blue states that are increasingly evaluating or acting on risks based on, based on ideology or grievance instead of any effort to assess, let alone calculate probability. Mm -hmm. And then you look at cybersecurity and AI emerging risks. And, you know, you realize that in today's very technological world, the bar for science and tech literacy has to be so much higher, but what have colleges and universities done in response? And the answer is not, not nearly enough. Certainly, you know, we have hundreds of new cybersecurity majors that we didn't have a decade ago, right? That's happened. But if you look at the, the, the total overall enrollment in science and tech programs, it hasn't nearly kept up with the demand and lots of colleges and universities actually restrict enrollment in these programs. And then when you do get in, uh, these programs tend to rely on what I call weed out courses and outdated prerequisites that really have, you know, a, a, a negative impact on uh, underrepresented groups, first generation students, women, and so forth. And, you know, my hypothesis was maybe colleges and universities aren't keeping up because it's hard to convince talented science and tech faculty to become leaders of these institutions. So we actually did an analysis and we looked at the top five officers at the top 20 schools in terms of, you know, selectivity and 61% of presidents, provosts, and deans have a science and tech background. We did a sample of Cal State and SUNY and the Pennsylvania state system institutions and only 38% of those leaders had any science, any degree anywhere with any science or tech in them. So, you know, 62% are humanities and social sciences and mm -hmm. so forth, which is great or would have was great a generation ago. But in my view, you know, you, you really need leadership that has, you know, network connections, interests in science and tech, if you want to try and transform what is effectively a broken engine of science and tech education. And that's, you know, not every school, obviously there's, there are, there are lots of less selective schools outside of the top 20 that are science tech focused to do a good job uh, on that. But, you know, Cal State Dominguez Hills, for example, needs to do more. You know, the notion that Cal State Dominguez Hills or East, East Stroudsburg University in the Pennsylvania system, that they're going to produce, you know, their share of accountants, but not engineers is really problematic for us in terms of 
national competitiveness, in terms of equity, and in terms of student, student outcomes. It's a real problem. So, you know, the punchline is if you're a board of trustees and you're doing a search for a president, or if you're a president and you're, you know, trying to figure out who the next dean of the undergraduate college is going to be. Obviously, you're prioritizing diversity, which we should, because our leadership should look like our, you know, population and the student body. But you should also be prioritizing science and tech in terms of choosing your leaders at these less selective schools. And if we do that, then I think we've got a shot at trying to make the change from a broken system to one that is really working and producing a lot more science and tech yeah. uh, grads. Yeah. And beyond the zeitgeist, the relevance of the don't look up angle, which I did appreciate the connection to pipelines into the private sector, where if you are an engineer, you have an engineering background and you've become a president of a university, it's more likely that your network is going to facilitate those pipelines, that your orientation towards those programs is going to be more designed for the future of work and where the jobs are going. Any read on that? Anything new and emerging around job trends? Or you mentioned cybersecurity. A lot of people are talking about Web3 nowadays. I don't know how you're reading what's emerging in the job marketplace, but I'd love to get a little bit of perspective from you on yeah, that. Yeah, you know, I mean, I think this the sort of new stuff on the margins gets it's probably too much attention. You know, I mean, there are 300,000 open unfilled Salesforce jobs in the country, right? I mean, Salesforce is doing their Olympic advertising. What is it? Team Earth. <laughs> let's not worry about Mars just yet. We've got problems at home. So, you know, let's not worry about emerging areas of AI and so forth. Let's focus on, you know, where the, where the jobs are, the unfilled jobs are. And they're in Salesforce and they're in all these sort of platforms, oriented skills, HubSpot and others. And Google just announced a hundred million dollar grant to, was it Europe and Merit America and one other, which is great because as of a year ago, their strategy was, well, let's just make these online asynchronous training programs available for free. But the problem is that the people we must care about are not going to get through those programs, you know, uh, these online asynchronous programs. And so they need, they need a wraparound immersive program, which is what the Europe's and Merit Americas of the world are providing. So that's absolutely the right, the right approach. We need to be training on the specific tech and platform skills that where these jobs are open and at a minimum providing, you know, wraparound services so that students will complete them. Still doesn't answer the fundamental question of who's going to hire these newly minted Google certified individuals uh, if they don't have work experience, Right, uh, which is where our model comes in. So our hire trade deploy models say, well, it starts with a job. You're hired from day one of training. You're being paid, you know, 45, $50,000 a year, even while you're training. And then you're going to be deployed on client mm -hmm. work. So that solves that. But I think we're making a lot of progress. I mean, if you look at where we were, you know, even three, four years ago, there's a lot more conversation, investment, even in, in Washington, D.C., you know, there are conversations that I'm having with people in the Department of Labor and others, Department of Commerce, around new initiatives and funding models, focusing on creating new pathways and incentivizing the kind of intermediaries who build these new pathways. Right. And then what about the critique around this segment of the workforce not going through a traditional four-year degree pathway, ultimately closing doors to them? What, what do you think about that argument? It's been a long time since I've heard that. I think that the answer is a job. Even the most sort of four-year degree-centric, progressive, really doesn't have much of a response when you say, well, but we're going to give them a job where they're making $50,000 a year plus benefits. Mm -hmm. And you know what, if it doesn't work out, right. If like, you know, after a year or two, they decide this is not for them or they need to learn a new skill set, are they better off or worse off than in the status quo when they're enrolling in a degree program at a less selective university and probably not completing and taking on student loan debt and not yeah. making any money. Right. So to me, the answer is, you know, apprenticeship is really, it has support across the spectrum. Mm -hmm. You know, the question is how to expand it. By the time this podcast comes out, we will have announced the creation of a new national nonprofit that I'm involved with called Apprenticeships for America, mm. where the goal is to create a national network of intermediaries and sponsors who are actually organizing 
apprenticeship programs for employers and advocating for funding and policies to support intermediaries like we've seen in countries like Australia and the UK. So not the Central European, Germany, Austria, Switzerland countries that have a long tradition of apprenticeship programs, but countries that 10 years ago were vir virtually nowhere in terms of expanding apprenticeship beyond the building and industrial trades, but have through policy incentivized intermediaries to really build these new pathways. So, you know, I think we're going to make a lot of progress here in the next five years. I think the idea, your average American five years from now will not immediately associate apprentice with welder or, mm. you know, electrician mm. the way they do today. Mm. And we'll be a better country for it because it means, you know, more higher value, lower risk pathways to economic opportunity and socioeconomic mobility. Yeah. That's great stuff. And that speaks to maybe the first of the two parts of the conversation we were talking about at the top, where that from without, that's the new pathways, the apprenticeship model, which is in, in some ways timeless too. That's a model that's been around. It was around before we had college, right? Exactly. I mean, it's, yeah. It's yeah. The original model. And it just goes to show you, but college, if you, and I talk about this in my first book, college really emerged as a way for the merchant class to, you know, demonstrate to society that their child was, you know, of a higher class. And so yeah. they're going to send them to college effectively. It was only basically 50, 60 years ago that we decided as a country that that was going to be the primary or sole pathway to good jobs. Mm -hmm. even, you know, even in the, in the seventies and, you know, maybe early eighties, that wasn't necessarily the, the case, but it's really been the last 30 years where that's been solidified. But I think from the Great Recession, it, it's begun to right. break apart. And what's missing now are the alternatives. And I think that once we have, you know, in every major city in the country, you know, dozens and dozens of these pathways that are providing friction-free, no tuition, get paid, guaranteed job into, you know, tech and healthcare and financial services and logistics careers, entry-level jobs and turning entry-level jobs into truly entry-level jobs because there are millions of them that, you know, are supposed to be entry-level jobs, but if you look at the skill and experience requirements, turn out to not be entry-level jobs anymore. Mm -hmm. Well, if you have intermediaries coming in and building these pathways and investing in the, in, in the talent, then they really do become entry-level jobs again, and you're building these, these, these bridges. Uh, and I'm convinced this is the single biggest domestic challenge this country has. I think that a lot of the social and political turmoil over the last decade has arisen from the sense that a, a large percentage of the population feels sort of shut out of economic opportunity and, and the dynamic economy, because we're telling them that college is the only pathway to it. And for lots of people that feels unrealistic. Mm -hmm. So how do we, how do we build those bridges? Yeah. Yeah, it's really interesting stuff. If you like what you're hearing, gapletter.com is where Ryan is putting these gems out there every couple of weeks. Recently, I saw you were writing about machine learning and artificial intelligence, which is another aspect of the evolution that is happening around jobs and the future of work. Any perspective on that? The point I was trying to make is that it seems like in many <laughs> respects, machines are doing a better job learning than people are, what can we learn from machine learning? But, you know, I, I, I think that when you have over 10 million unfilled jobs in the country, you know, we don't really need to focus yet on all the jobs that are going to be lost or transformed through technology. Mm -hmm. the, the, the focus really ought to be on how do we take people who are unemployed or underemployed or unhappily employed and skill them and provide them with the requisite work experience so that they'll be able to go in and fill some of those jobs. Yeah. And, you know, technology has always changed uh, the nature of work and it's going to do so. And I, I, I don't feel like we're going to see a step function change, you know, even with AI and RPA and so forth. I feel like it's going to be, you know, more of a, more of the same in terms of the level of change that we've, we've seen over the past, you know, decade or two. And then what about the evolution on the employer side, which I, I saw you noting IBM and other organizations removing degree yeah. requirements and, and also for a lot of your thinking to work, it requires engagement with the private sector to develop the apprenticeship. What's been happening in that space? Yes. Yeah, so look, I would divide the employers into three camps. You've got the visionary mission-driven employers like IBM and I think Ernst and & Young and 
others that really understand the current hiring system has not only created issues in terms of talent shortages for their company and workforce, um, is creating bigger social problems as well. And so making an intentional effort to change hiring practices really from the top of the hiring funnel on through. That means removing degree requirements from job descriptions. Interestingly, I just saw yesterday, Indeed, the biggest job board just did that for their own jobs. <laughs> ah. It's a good <laughs> indication. They just removed degree requirements from their own jobs. Hmm. And then the second category would be employers who are sort of being forced to make changes simply because they can't fill, they can't find talent. So I think that's a bigger pool of employers, but the biggest pool are employers who are just doing nothing uh, <laughs> and leaving, leaving jobs unfilled. Hmm. What will it take? to solve that. And, and again, our answer is I, I take a, a rather Hobbesian view of employers. I, I think that, you know, they're not going to change. They're focused on a hundred other more important priorities, like selling more and generating more revenue and, you know, talent and hiring is, you know, secondary or tertiary. Obviously it's an input. But if you're, if you're mean, British and nasty, you know, it's, it's not your top priority. Shout out to yeah. Thomas Hobbes. So we think that the answer is we need intermediaries to kind of serve up perfectly trained, experienced talent on a silver platter for them. And they won't say no. Mm -hmm. And I think that probably characterizes 90% of employers out there. They're not going to change. They're not going to run their own apprenticeship programs, but they will take talent and they'll they'll pay for it. If you train them up, give them experience and deliver it. So, you know, I I think that this uh, emerging intermediary uh, ecosystem is going to be very large. Could it be as large as the current post-secondary education system? Yeah, probably not, but it'll certainly be a reasonable fraction mm-hmm. of that size as, as we bridge that gap. And that's a, that'll be a big market. Yeah. And we've made it almost a half hour into this conversation without talking about the great reshuffle, the great resignation, the great, right. uh, whatever you're going to call it. What are your thoughts on the spirit of the troops out there in terms of the broader job market? career sensibility? Is that myth? Is that real? No, it's absolutely real. Even at our, our own portfolio company, I mean, fortunately they're all sort of impact oriented mission driven, which is not something every company can say. So we haven't really had retention uh, issues at our companies, but I, I understand it. it makes perfect sense. There are a lot of jobs out there that are just bad jobs. And a lot of those jobs, you know, particularly frontline worker jobs in, you know, hospitality and travel and logistics and transportation and so forth, you know, what is the, what's the pathway? And so I've written about how you have these large employers of frontline workers like Amazon, for example, that have been investing in, well, initially it was free college, (laughs) which was primarily uh, a retention uh, tool as opposed to a sort of upskilling or human capital development tool, they would literally measure, they, they wouldn't try to measure human capital development, but they would measure, you know, if you're enrolled in an online degree program that we're paying for, how much longer do we get to keep you right. in your bad job? Mm-hmm. So benefiting the employer more than the employee mm-hmm. in large ways, but that's going to migrate over the next few years to pathways that are, you know, are not off the shelf online degrees that online universities want to sell that are probably barely related, if at all, to, you know, the career aspirations of of the worker or realistic pathways, but instead individualized pathways for that company. So at Amazon, you know, how do you get from, you know, picking, packing and shipping to working as an entry-level developer at Amazon? What does that pathway look like? It's not going to look like a degree program from an online university. It it will look like a series of short, discrete, module, skill-based to take you from here to there that's specific to that, to those jobs at that company. And so, you know, I think that's going to be a big sector. I think that's where the sort of guilds and edifices and instrides are heading. And I think that's where Coursera wants to go as well to build these, you know, intra enterprise pathways for you now frontline workers and really all entry level workers who want to move on and, and move up. And it's that, that sort of uh, pathway that turns an intolerable job into a tolerable job because you, you have a path, you have a clear path and you see where you're going. And I think the economic mobility that we're trying to build, you know, in building these bridges from 
the education to the employment ecosystem, we need an equal number built within large enterprises. Right. We can accomplish both of those things. It'll be a better country. Yeah. And then at the same time, folks will need to be portable when they go to their next job. They want to be able to identify the skills and the competencies that they have. I know that's another space that you are tracking. Any thoughts on the credentialing, micro-credentialing that space? Well, we just sold Credly to Pearson and that was great. And Pearson's going to become a leader in this digital credentialing space. But yeah, it's, it's part of the, even 10 years ago, we were still in the realm of the macro credential, which is the degree, which, you know, employers, if you have a degree, employers kind of had a sense of, you know, you were capable that you'd learned to learn, you know, you could do hard work, you could buckle down, you could, you could stick with something for a period of years. The, the sheepskin effect, I believe it's been called. Yeah. Yeah. And those are all characteristics of a good employee. And now, you know, it's much more skill specific and we have the ability to assess and measure skills and award micro or digital credentials and recognition of those skills. Incredibly basically built out the plumbing for awarding those credentials. The problem is that employers still don't really have a way to understand what those credentials mean mm. in terms of skills, particularly at the top of the hiring funnel. If you've got a thousand applicants for a job and you decide to interview 20 of them, you know, once you're interviewing the 20 of them, you're going to be able to have a conversation with the candidate about the micro credentials they may or may not have. And you'll be able to have some understanding of that. The, the problem is that as at the, the top of the funnel, your applicant tracking systems really aren't yet equipped to evaluate those micro credentials and make sure that candidates with the right micro credentials are making it through and candidates that, you know, don't have them or not making it through. Yeah. As you start digging, it gets more and more complex because, you know, how do you, what kind of assessments do you need? And, and then it gets, That's right. gets pretty involved. The other thing that we haven't really gotten into is what's happening in the learning experience itself. I believe when you were talking about the Winter Olympics, you were outlining some of the features of good online learning and, and ways in which the, the design makes sense. I know you are also making some investments into the, the learning experience and that side of the ecosystem. Any high level thoughts or, or perspectives to share on the, the learning side of the equation? Yeah, we've just been through a remarkable period of online learning during COVID and uh, we know what works. <laughs> We know, we know what doesn't work and there's still millions of students enrolled in sort of old line, asynchronous text-based online courses that don't have, you know, any synchronous component, don't have integrated experiential learning, aren't taught by practitioners, don't have stackable credentials, preferably consisting of industry certifications instead of made up certificates, employers don't or won't understand, don't have mentoring, don't really have built-in career services or tracking, don't have on-ramps, don't have off-ramps. You know, all this requires investment. The good news is that we have a number of very large online universities that are generating a lot of surplus mm -hmm. for their public and nonprofit owners that do have the potential to build much, if not all of this into their programs, but we're not there yet. And so we just need to realize that we're still, although we've been through two years of online learning, we're still in the early innings yeah. uh, of online learning. But students, students will go where the outcomes uh, are. And if you're an online university and you're not doing any of the things I just mentioned, you know, odds are your outcomes, your employment outcomes are going to be poorer, which means that you're not going to attract talented students in the door. You're not going to get employers and it's just going to be a vicious circle, you know, there it's going to require investment. Yeah. And, and then there are some good examples out there. Western governors and Southern New Hampshire generally are, are perceived as positive aspects of the model, but there's a little bit of murkiness as far as what do we mean by an online university? You know, you were talking recently about the use of global in your, in the names. There's, there, there's interesting stuff to be had. I would recommend this newsletter, the gap letter, subscribe to it, hear from Ryan some more. As we're getting closer to conclusion, outside of the stuff that we've been talking about, 
looking further down the road or more of moonshot type ideas, anything outside of education in the space you've been focusing on, what else is capturing your imagination these days? Are there other ideas or things that people should be paying attention to? Yeah, just on the credentialing front, I'm thinking a lot about crypto. I'm thinking how we can use crypto as a sort of decentralized incentive system to incentivize people to identify, validate, and act on skills. Hmm. We'll see, see if anything comes of it. Yeah. But I read an interesting article in the New York Times about a company called Helium, which is a network of essentially hotspots and the way they built the network and encouraged people to essentially, you know, contribute their hotspot to the network was to pay them in a new, you know, digital currency. Yeah. I think that's interesting. The way in which micro credentials sort of busts out and, and becomes the norm requires a decentralized incentive system to encourage people. You know, do you know how LinkedIn allows you to sort of recommend skills for friends and colleagues and so yeah. forth? Mm -hmm. There's no accountability to that. Mm -hmm. I don't know how frequently that's used or relied upon, but there has to be a way to use what I'll call a skills coin <laughs> to incentivize the people who actually know if you have skills to identify them, to validate them, and then for employers to act on them and reward the people who identified those appropriately. Yeah. The, the crypto connection is interesting because frequently I've heard the connection to blockchain. Yeah. But, but the incentive that's built. Yeah. Putting a digital credential on a blockchain is fine. If from a functionality standpoint, is that different from what Credly is doing today? Not really. Mm -hmm. Not really. So to me, the leap is how do you incentivize people to identify skills and hold them accountable for making sure they're right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's interesting. And you could definitely see that all powered on the new emerging. We'll put on our VR headsets and we'll start federating each other's skills in crypto. A lot of that is hooked up. But I think the idea that, you know, again, a decentralized incentive system around skills and credentials, someone's going to figure it out. So maybe it'll yeah. be us. Yeah. All right. It's a nice one maybe to end on. Ryan Craig is the managing director of Achieve Partners. He's also the writer behind The Gap Letter, which I would recommend folks to subscribe to. Lots going on here. Ryan, always a pleasure to have you on. By the way, talking about incentives, with your third appearance on Trending in Education, you qualify for a refrigerator magnet. So I'm going to be easy with that. But thank you so much for joining us. That's great. That's great. Good to see you, Michael. Thanks for the conversation. Awesome. Hopefully you enjoyed what you're hearing. If you did, write us a review, share the good word. We'll be back again soon. This is Trending in Education.